Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Senior Advisor to U.S. Special Presidential Envoy for Climate, John Kerry, David Livingston. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Dubai. Welcome to COP28. It's a great pleasure to be with you here today for a first-of-a-kind discussion on advancing international partnerships for fusion energy commercialization. It's long been said that fusion energy is the canonical clean energy fantasy that's always, that has been 30 years away and always will be. But I'm pleased to say that we can say with utmost confidence that thanks to a fusion of public and private collaboration, not only in, across multilateral partnerships, but also driven by the engine of commercial ingenuity in the United States and in other countries around the world, that 30-year envelope to achieve clean energy abundance is finally within reach. Of course, no country, no company can do this alone. And it is for that reason that this promising clean energy baseload resource must be developed in concert among like-minded partners that collaborate with one another from the start, that build logically on the steps that have been taken by scientists, by labs, and by companies and workshops in the years prior. It is that sort of international approach to pulling together partnerships for the commercialization of fusion energy that we're here to discuss today. And it is my pleasure to introduce the perfect person to lay out such a strategy. My boss, Special Presidential Envoy for Climate, Secretary John Kerry. Ladies and gentlemen, I accept the nomination. <laughs> what can I say? Uh, I, am, I am one of those uh, 30 years from now guys, because when I was serving in the United States Senate, uh, and representing, I had the privilege of representing MIT and Harvard and so forth, and obviously proving it took a Yale man to properly represent Harvard. Um, but um, I used to hear constantly, because when I was in the Senate, MIT would come to me and say, we've got this idea, we're really trying to pursue this thing. And um, I, without knowing that much about it, but uh, went to work on it and got to know a lot about it. I visited many times, several times in uh, Cambridge. And uh, Bob Mumpower is here somewhere. I don't know where he is. There he is. Bob, thank you for a great visit at Commonwealth Fusion the other day. And my great pal who helped uh, me enormously in the negotiations with Iran on the Iran nuclear agreement, Ernie Moniz, and our former Secretary of Energy is here, and he's taught me some things about this. But uh, I would hear, you know, as an energy source, really, it's going to be 30 years away. I'd so help me. And go in 10 years later, it's 30 years away. Uh, but I happened to be out in California. I was visiting Google X and trying to learn more about some of the technologies that are online and went up to the accelerator, uh, Livermore Laboratory, and, and listened to the scientists there talking excitedly about what had happened in this minuscule of seconds that, that they had created enough heat to actually prove the process could, in fact, work. So uh, I went out and saw Commonwealth the other day where there's a great deal of construction taking place. So this is, ex this is exciting, but I can't tell you how many years away it is. I'm not sure Bob or others can either yet. But Almost to the day, 70 years ago, uh, President Eisenhower delivered an historic Adams for Peace speech. Now, I'm not mentioning that because you're in for an historic uh, speech about Adams or fission versus fusion, et cetera, but I am here to say uh, that that idea of urging nations to come together uh, to harness the power of science for peaceful pursuits uh, and benefit mankind, humankind, generally, uh, clearly is more than a worthy goal. It's the highest aspiration, if you will, of diplomacy, of foreign policy, of strategic interests. And I thank 
the Atlanta Council, thank you, Fred, for the work you guys do always to bring the most relevant issues to the table at the critical times. So today I'm privileged to be here with a, with a, without any pretension in terms of escalating the size of the charge that we're trying to issue today. But I am here to try to again harness the power of fundamental physics and human ingenuity in response to a crisis. And in this case, I think everybody here understands because you're at COP28, which is 27 COPs too many. Uh, you're here to help us figure out how we are really going to thread this needle. The crisis could not be more clear, and I'm not here to run through all of the evidence, but when it's 70 degrees above normal in the Arctic during the summer, this past summer, and 100 degrees Fahrenheit, above normal in the Antarctic, and we're learning about this massive thousands of years of iceberg uh, that has broken off because it was stuck in the mud for years, but now it's melting away. And so it moved, and it's going out towards Georgia Island, and it will, along with 86 million metric tons a day from just one fjord up in uh, Greenland, uh, continue to shock the scientists. And now we are hearing from the best scientists in the world that they're alarmed some say terrified. Others have altogether said we are in, are, are in uncharted territory. And if you're a government official, if you're in public life, there is, after all, I think, a precautionary principle about governance where when scientists are presenting you with facts and Mother Nature herself is presenting you with facts, like 18 separate $1 billion climate events in the United States last year, you ought to stop and really think about what's going on and then figure out how you're going to respond to it. And that's what we're doing here. Uh, fusion energy certainly can excite the mind and it can excite the spirit of possibilities that exist in all of us as human beings. And the evidence is now clear uh, about how critical this choice is for us to try to move forward faster. I personally believe, based on what I've read and learned and talking with people like Ernie Muniz and others, Ernie was just telling me a moment ago about how a visit he made a number of years ago when he didn't really believe completely in this possibility or this track. But a visit and, and, and the evidence of how far people had progressed convinced him, and I'm sure he'll talk about it on the panel, of the possibilities, and he's now fully engaged in this quest. So I believe, based on friends I have, people I respect, evidence that I've read, that there is potential in fusion to revolutionize our world and to change all of the options that are in front of us and provide the world with abundant and clean energy without the harmful emissions of traditional energy sources. And while we've had a little debate in the last few days about what the evidence shows or doesn't show of science, science clearly tells us, without any question whatsoever, that the cause of this crisis is one of the simplest things we could try to figure out. It's about math and physics telling us that it's emissions it's the way we burn fossil fuels without capturing the emissions. And we have two options, either capture the emissions or don't burn it. That's really where we are. And we've got to figure out what we're going to do at a critical pace. Fusion, I believe, can be a critical piece of our energy future, obviously, along with wind and solar and nuclear fission and geothermal and other uh, forms of energy, but the cadence of new and exciting fusion announcements has obviously increased over time. New startups are exploring exciting new modalities for fusion energy. There are a lot of different, uh, uh, different approaches that are in many of the different companies that have sprung up pursuing this, some further along than others, obviously. But all of them begin to tell us that new computational tools and new materials uh, help us realize and harness the energy of a burning plasma. And of course, the landmark uh, announcement about ignition from the National Laboratory last year. So we are edging ever closer to a fusion-powered reality. And at the same time, yes, 
significant scientific and engineering challenges exist, yes. And careful thought and thoughtful policy is going to be critical to be able to navigate this critical juncture. The United States was uh, proud to announce its bold decadal vision for commercial fusion energy last year, built on a series of public and private sector partnerships to accelerate the research over the next decade towards a full demonstration of fusion energy. But it is clear we cannot realize this grand ambition, perhaps not at all, but certainly not at the pace we need to, doing it alone. Science is inherently international, and scientists behave differently from a lot of other, uh, a lot of other folks uh, who, who are engaged in these debates. Uh, and fusion has actually benefited greatly from a strong tradition of international partnership. The ITER, the largest uh, science infrastructure project in the world, which brings together 35 nations and is critical to the effort, uh, I think everybody understands we've got to improve the way the international effort can happen. And that's part of what will be talked about today as we lay out this road ahead uh, for a international structure. Uh, <clears throat> collaboration and knowledge shared are essential to beginning to accelerate what we're trying to do. And they are vital as we collectively tackle the scientific and, and engineering challenges that lie ahead. So, building on a decadal vision, I'm pleased to announce the U.S. International Engagement Plan for Fusion Energy. Engagement plan, key words. This strategy identifies five areas of work that will help us to realize <clears throat> the promise of this technology. And they are uh, R&D, supply chain and marketplace, uh, regulation, workforce, and education and engagement. And this is a call to action, folks. And you'll hear in the panel, you couldn't have a more distinguished panel. I think it will help lay out for everybody a clear understanding of this roadmap of, this roadmap of collaboration and of sharing and of building on all of our strengths. This is a human challenge, mankind challenge. It is, in fact, as existential as it has been described. And if it is existential and all of our countries are threatened, and they are, and all life is threatened, and it is, then we need to pull ourselves together with every strength we have and every capacity we have in order to pursue every option there is to get there as fast as we can. Atoms for Peace, which, by the way, was, um, was delivered on, I think, December 8th. So three days from now, we're sort of bringing history back together here. Uh, and it was, it was really... Uh, President Eisenhower at his best in terms of his vision. He is, after all, the president who warned us about an industrial, military-industrial complex. Uh, uh, he had a vision uh, in lots of ways. Uh, and uh, it was ultimately about progress and harmony, setting aside boundaries in order to work as a united front. Uh, together, I am convinced with determination and with unity, with the spirit of cooperation, understanding the stakes, we can act with determination and unity. We can harness the remarkable power of atoms and, of, and, and, and matter in order to build a clean energy future, leaving a legacy of hope and sustainable and thriving world for generations to come. I think that's why this auditorium is full I think that's why I see so many serious folks, many of whom I know, sitting here. Uh, this is a good moment, uh, and we just need to make the most of it. Thank you all very, very much.